y'all keep saying that, and I want y'all to listen to my sermon Sunday night. I'm listening to what you're saying. Good. Well, good evening. It's good to see you tonight. I'm a few minutes late, but we have have a little church talk among our folks here sometimes before we get on the air. We got that squared away. But I got something I want you to pray with me about. I'm going to play a song in a minute. And it talks about, in that song, the names of Jesus. It's Michael song, uh, Combs' song. Brother Lynn and I were talking about that last Sunday. They deal so much with the Savior and with Jesus, and the salvation and the cross. I mean, he, he's not, a, that's, that's what he does. That's what he sings about. And I've been, I've listened to these things over and over and over and over and over. And God's touched my heart. And, and this is how I need we pray. I feel like I just think where spiritually did I need to be. I really don't. I don't know how to explain that to you. But I can listen to this, like this song right here. And I can get so emotional about that. And I'm thinking, why can't you be like that all the time? Why can't you get that spiritual part? of it right I, you can read the Bible I can study the Bible know a little bit about it but it's that spiritualness that I want the older I get I need more of that and so you pray that God will show me where I'm missing or what I need to do or whatever on that but this this song here is I think the name of it is some call him Jesus some call him Savior some call him Lord what do we call it? I hope all those names. Play it for us, Dwight. <laughs> Up to Calvary, to an old rugged cross. They mocked him, they cursed him, his holy name. Yet even while dying, he gave life to a dead man. No wonder they call him the Savior. No wonder, no wonder they, call they call him the Redeemer. Redeemer. For his precious blood.
cross There they mocked him, beat him, cursed him His precious holy name Yet even while dying He gave life to a dead man no wonder they call him the Savior. No wonder Amen. The song there makes me cry. How many I listen to make me cry? I bet I've listened to that thing 20 times today. And I want to feel what he did for me on that cross. I want it here. I want it real to know exactly what I cost him. And I, I, I know I'll never know all of it. But I've got a desire in my, my life to know him better in a more spiritual way than I do. That's what I need for you to pray for. All right. Let's go back to the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, we're good. Go back to the book of 1 Samuel where we left off. We started last Wednesday night talking about Hannah. Hannah's name means grace. Hannah, like most people, was going through a rough time in her life. She was miserable. She was not happy in her marriage, in her home. And she was at a point of desperation. I have told every church I've pastored in the last 30 years this, and I've told you all this. In a lifetime, for me, and I watch people, there are usually four or five events that will happen that will change your life and put it in a new direction. I'm not talking about the everyday thing. I'm talking about a radical something when you get married, right? Changes your life. When you get saved, there ought to be a radical change there. When God takes you out of a terrible valley and puts your feet back on the ground and gets your life started off in a new direction, all these things ought to be there. This is where Hannah was. She was dire. She was desperate. And if you remember when we stopped last week, her husband had come to her. He, he, he talked to her. He said, honey, don't I? He actually said, remember the greatest blessing that uh, ladies in the Bible could have was to have male children? Because if you, if you didn't, you were looked down on and you thought God was punishing you. And he said, did I love you more than ten children, ten sons? I love you more than I could love ten sons. This was the turning point. This is where she's in the valley of despair. Her husband comes and talks to her. And there's a change coming. I mean a radical change in her life. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about those things. So when we look after they have this conversation in verse 8, or uh, verse 7, no, verse 8 is where we left off last Wednesday night. Do I not, am I not better thee than ten sons, okay? After Hannah heard this, she gets up. Life, she's getting a little different perspective. She's getting, for whatever reason, a little more hope in her life. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh. Now remember, they're in Shiloh for the feast. They're there for worship. They'll stay there for several days during this Passover feast. That, and they go to different places and do it, and that's where they're at. And she gets up, it says, and after she had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now remember the things that we said about her when we started... What was one of the most noticeable things about what she was going through? Remember what he said? 
You're not eating. You're not drinking. I really believe if she were living in a modern day world, this is what the psychiatrist would tell her. You're in a deep depression, honey. And you get, I know I haven't been there, but I've been with a lot of folks that have. Sometimes it turns out well, sometimes it don't turn out so good. But when you put God in the mix, and that's what she does after she talks with her husband, they sit down to a meal together. She rose up. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. Now they're there at the temple for the purpose of worship. When she gets through, or at some point, I'm not sure when the time is this, she leaves and goes to the temple. Eli is the priest of that temple. And Eli is sitting at the door at the gate or the entrance into where uh, the temple is. Now, this is what happens sometimes. And this is what I, now this is what I, I see. And I find it has been true in my life over the years. That sometimes the physical, personal issues that you have to deal with in life sometimes will take you away from the spiritual issues. The things of this world can get our focus sometimes until we, if we're not careful, we'll lose our focus on God. It can get that bad, folks. It does get that bad for a lot of people. I really think this is what Hannah had done. She'd become so discouraged, so disheartened. And she hadn't focused on God like she should have. But after she talks to her husband and they have a meal together, where does she go? To the church. To the church. I just wish and you do, I'm not talking about y'all, that Christians could get how important it is to come to the house of God. Folks, when she needed something, where did she go? She got back to the temple. She went to the church. Eli was there. And what did she do? First, it describes her spirit. She was bitter, angry. Why? Because the other wives were slamming her, and especially it just at this feast they're at, right in front of everybody, she's putting her down and putting her down and putting her down. And so sometimes, if we're not careful, Bitterness will get the best of us. One of the worst things that, for me, that can ever happen in a Christian's witness is when they get so bitter at somebody that they can't let it go or get over it. I'll tell you, this is what I've learned, because I've probably been there sometimes in my life, not for any extended period of time. Like some people, things happened to them up 10 years ago, and they still hold it against somebody. I know people like that. That's crazy. It's crazy to be a Christian and not be able to move on from that. Because this is what I've learned. I can have my bitterness and I can be mad. But here's the problem. Who's getting hurt by it the most? I am. You think the person I'm mad at gives a rip about I'm mad with them or not? Probably not. But I'll sit and stew and can't sleep and talk about them and everything else, and they just out having life. Because what do they care about what Jimmy says about them? Sometimes you just got to let it go. When she went, I want you to know, and this is another thing about church. Church ought to change you, shouldn't it? I'm going to tell you something. Church ought to change you. That's kind of what I'm trying to tell y'all about me. I'm a long way from being where I need to be. I, I need to take another step. She goes into that church, and she's angry. She's mad. You ever been to church angry and mad? I have. <laughs> I 
There are a lot of people shaking their head. <laughs> but I want you to look how she goes in. And when we get to it, look how she comes out. She comes out a different person than when she went in there. When she walked by Eli and saw him sitting at the gate of the church, she was mad, discouraged, angry. It used the term bitterness in there. And all these years of tears that she, and it's been years she's been dealing with this, and hurt and stuff that she went through, I believe this. I don't know the answer to this, but I've heard people say it, and I don't think they know the answer to it either. When they get to the bottom of the barrel, they'll change. You ever heard anybody say that? What will it take for them to change? Well, they got to sink all the way to the bottom. I don't know if that's a true statement or not. Because I'm not sure we know exactly where the bottom is. Because I've said that a lot myself. Here's a lady for years, years, has deal, dealt with this. And you would have thought that something would have come about because of her barrenness there. But the problem with her barrenness that she had not having a child, this was the problem. It was also causing her to have a spiritual barrenness a spiritual barrenness that's the danger when we hold bitterness and stuff like this she had a bitterness in her where was that bitterness at in her soul in her being it hurt bitterness in her soul but what did she do she prayed, and she wept sore. That word sore means she wept many tears here. She went to church. I'm glad that we were praying church. This, this, this one verse here ought to encourage us every time we go to an altar or when we get ready and leave here and pray, this verse of scripture right here ought to encourage Southside Baptist Church because that's what we do. We do that. She went in with bitterness, and she prayed. She didn't. I want you to notice this. She walked right by Eli, didn't she? He's the head honcho at that church. She did not even say a word to him. She, she headed into that temple, past the priest, got down on her knees, and prayed. Do you know that in those days how unusual that was? In those days, what have I been teaching you on Sunday night out of Hebrews for a month now? Or on Sunday morning? The priest, the high priest, everything was done through them. If it's ever proved that when Jesus died on the cross that the Bible says that he tore the veil in the temple down, Folks, I want to tell you, here's a lady believed it was poured, tore down before it was tore down. She didn't go by and tap the priest on the shoulder and say, could you come pray with me? No. She ignored him. And she went right into the temple and prayed for herself. Prayed, and that would have been different from most any man of that day, any woman. And when she prayed, she wept. Tears. The Bible says she wept many tears. So I'm thinking, this may not be a, lo a little short prayer here that's going on with her. I'm thinking she's pouring her heart out to the Lord here. So, And she's so enamored with what has happened and what could happen. She's, she's torn here. She's weeping and she's weeping because I think this, she don't know what it's going to be like when she gets up and there, but she's got hope now. She's got hope now. She's prayed. Well, the Bible says in verse 11, she vowed a vow. Now, when I, when I read that word or see that word in the Bible, 
this is the scripture that all, no matter where I'm preaching and where I'm reading and where I'm studying at, anytime I see anything that has to do with something like that, I remember that scripture in the Bible that says, you're better off not to make a vow than you are to make a vow and break it. Don't promise God something and don't do what you promise he's going to do. The Bible says Hannah made a vow. She talked to God. She promised God. She was, she was in desperation, and she says to him, O oh Lord of hosts, that term Lord of hosts, uh, remember when I just played you that song, all the names that they may call Jesus? Savior, Lord, Redeemer, all. I, when I did Good Friday service, I had that sermon on three men on the cross, and I give you a litany of names of what the Bible calls Jesus, the bright and morning star. The rose of Sharon. It's just, the Bible's full of... But in heaven, he's known as the Lord of hosts. That means he's the Lord of heaven. He's, he's over the angels. He's over every heavenly army that there's ever been, that he is the leader, he is the, the Lord of those folks. And she recognizes that. When it says Lord of hosts, the second meaning that could have is this. And I think she was probably referring to the first one that I just gave you, but it also, it also can mean this. The one that hung the stars. The one that hung the moon. The one that gives us air, that gives us sunshine, gives us heat and cool. He's the Lord of all that. It can mean one of those two things. But she knew who she was praying to. That's the thing. She knew. And then this is the vow. I always think this, this. When I read something like this, this is what I always think. I don't know if I could do that or not. I'm a little leery myself about trying to bargain with God here and saying to God, well, if God, you do this, I'll do that. In essence, that's what she's doing, though, isn't it? That's what she's doing. I'm a little weary of that. I don't think we ought to test God too much. I think we better be careful with that. But she was right on the money now. I'm not I'm just saying I'm talking about more or less me now. There's only one time in the Bible, all 66 books, where God says, test me. Where's it at? When it comes to the tithe. He said, test me. And see, if you give the tithe to the house of God, he says in that scripture, test me. And see if I won't pour you out a blessing that you can't understand. So you give the tithe, I'm telling you, the blessings come. So she says, Lord, this is the deal. She says, but I tell you, when you make, but let, let me rephrase. None of us ever knows what kind of condition we might get in, do we? None of us, really, we've been in some tough times, but none of us really know sometimes how desperate it might get, and that might be the worst we've ever been, and we might be in such a state of mind that we might pray like this too. We, I can't criticize her because I ain't been in her shoes. I didn't know how she felt. It's very possible that we could pray like that if it got bad enough for us. She vowed a vow, said, O Lord, post, if thou would indeed look, on the affliction of thy handmaid. Do you not think God's been looking at her? Does it sometimes, and I, 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 I can go to Jimmy Holly, but sometimes in your life when you're not as close, and that's what I keep trying, I need as close to God as you need to be, this is the way it feels sometimes. Like God's way out yonder somewhere and I'm way down here. That God's so busy with all the things going on in the world, what does my little problems have to do? I think that might have been her because she asked God the question. She said, the first thing I need to do is ask you to look on the affliction of thy handmaid. Two things here. The affliction. The other thing. 
She called herself God's handmaid. So that meant she was a child of God. That she loved the Lord. She had just gotten in such a state that she had lost some contact with him. And he said, will you look at me and, Lord, remember me. Remember me. And then she says, and not forget thy hand. That's the second time she calls herself his handmaid. Remember, look at me, Lord, what I'm going through. And when she says remember, I, 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 I'm giving personal stuff here. I think she may have been like this. Lord, I just didn't get here today. God, I've been going through for a long time. Can you remember all the heartaches and all the heartbreaks and all this that's brought me down to this place I'm at right now? It didn't happen last night. Lord, this thing's been working on. Say, so can you remember? And don't forget me. I can promise you. One thing is a child of God, he'll never forget you. He's always looking at you. I, I like what she said here because this is what I think about most of us today. Most Christians that are not living as close to God as they ought to live forget, I believe sometimes, that God's watching us. If I go somewhere I don't need to go, who's going with me? God. If I do something I ought not to do, who's watching me? If I use language that I ought not to use, who's watching me? God. God. She said, Lord, watch me. Lord, remember me. And then if you go on into the scripture there for the third time, she uses the term, thy handmaiden. Thy handmaiden. Remember me, not forget thy handmaiden, but will give unto thy handmaiden, third time, a man child. How many times have you had a preacher before me and those that will come after me? How many times have you heard, if, if you hadn't heard it, the preacher ought to be ashamed of yourself. That when you pray to God, you don't need to beat around the bush with God when you pray. Let me tell you something. If your eyes hurting, pray about your eyes. If your child's driving you crazy and can't get his or her life straight, you go to God and say, Lord, I want to pray for this baby. I want to pray for this boy. I want to pray for this girl. Don't generalize. You can say this, and I say this every night when Lynn and I pray before we go to bed. I say, God, please take care of my family. I say that every night of my life. Now, I mean, but sometimes it gets repetitious, and it's just kind of what you say, ain't it? Until something happens to your family. And then what you do? You start calling names then, don't you? It's all right to pray for your family, but when the, when the hammer hits and one of your childs, one of your boys, one of your girls, somebody's in trouble, you know what you're going to do, what I do? I call their name. She's very specific in praying. I heard a preacher, I've heard many preachers say, Brother, Lynn has two. I've gotten some of these conferences you go to, these preachers are preaching, and they call them shotgun prayers. You just, like a shotgun, in a shotgun, you got a lot of shot in one shell. And it just, when you shoot it, it just scatters out. That's where a lot of people pray. But if you got a rifle, you hone on it, there ain't but one shot coming out there, and you need for that one shot to count. That's why when I pray for you or somebody in here that, that is, is struggling, I call their name. I pray for everybody. We do for the whole church, for the whole sick list. But sometimes somebody just needs their name called. How many songs I prayed you about in McCamish? When There's one song that McCamish sang, I remembered you last night in prayer. That they sing. She said, Lord, this is, this is the deal. I got another hour. Okay. This is the deal. She said, I want a baby. Not just any baby. 
I want a little boy. Can you get more specific than that? I want a baby and I want a boy baby. God heard it. Listen to me, Lord. Remember me. This is what I'm asking you for. This is what I want is a boy baby here. A man child. Now, this is the bargaining part. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall be no razor that come upon his head. This is the deal. You give him to me, God, I'll give him back to you. When he gets old enough, I can wean him and get him away. God, you can have him. Now, we, that's, a, that's don't you think that's a pretty tough deal for a woman that's weighed all these years and been through and wanted to get that little boy and then you usher him out the door when he's about three or four years old and let him go? We talk about it, but do you think this was easy for this mama to do this? I promise you. This is prayer working here. This is her pouring her heart out to God to give her a little child. She has prayed. She has wept. We have talked about those things. Now when she gets to the point, Lord, give me a little boy. And most of us today, we'd be happy with either one. They come from God. They're a blessing from God. So, it came to pass. She continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Can I tell you about me praying sometimes? I, uh, I pray silently a lot. I, I can pray when I'm riding down the road. I can be studying something in that office in there and God will hit me. And I have prayer. Me and God. Me and God. Now, Rhonda and I will always pray before I leave together for everything, but I'm hours in there studying, and sometimes something just hits you, and you've got to talk to God about it. I love it. But I'd rather pray out loud than I had silently. I just don't know. Maybe it's just the, the, the physical part of it that, when you're talking to, to somebody, you feel like if you're talking out loud to them that you're getting your message across to them. Yeah, I, I think that's probably it. And that's, that's what's, what's going on uh, with her as she prays. Now, she made him another promise, too. Don't, let me put this in here. She said, no razor will touch this boy's head. I promise you, he ain't never going to get no haircut. He'd be in style today, wouldn't he? <laughs> but that was a vow in uh, those days of, of uh, Nazarite vow that they made. That when somebody took the Nazarite vow, this is what they said. I'm not going to cut my hair. I'm not going to drink any kind of alcohol. I'm not going to touch a dead body or anything. I promise God I'll not do any of those things. Now, this, this is cool here. This is mama making a vow for a son that ain't been conceived yet. God, I'll give him to you, and I'll tell you what he's going to be like, God. I'm going to make it you. He's going to take the Nazarite vow. This kid's going to be good now. We go start him out right. Well, she might have left Eli at the door, but the priest walks in 
and seize it. Now, I like two words in that scripture where it says, I don't know how long it was before he came in that church. But it says she was continuing praying. Continuing. Now I've had uh, preachers tell me this. I've had people all my life tell me this. I don't agree with it. And I, I can be wrong because I do it. So I, if it's wrong, I do it. I had a preacher tell me one time, Jimmy, that if you pray for something and you ask God for something and you talk to God about it, you don't never need to do it again. Because God don't forget anything. What you say, remember, God knows what you ask him and you ain't got to keep bugging him about it. I'm going to tell you what, I'm a bugger. I'll bug him to death. My wife is sick. You don't think every day I didn't pray bugging him to death about her? You better believe I did. Could I have just prayed that first day she went sick in the hospital and went on and done my business and never prayed for her again about that? Uh uh-uh. uh. That might have been the right thing to do, but I didn't do that. And I'll tell you something. I don't want you to never stop praying for me. I ask you to pray tonight. I want you to pray that he'll get the spiritual, whatever God you're trying to tell him. That's what I want, that you just reveal it to him. But I don't just want you to pray at one time. I want you when you pray tomorrow. So the preacher asks his prayer. I want you to know, God, I pray whatever you, you need to do in him, God, you do it. Next day, however long you want to do it. Prayer. He, she, she continued in prayer after the vows were made. Eli came in. The Bible says that he was looking at the movement of the mouth. But there wasn't nothing coming out. Why? I don't know. I don't think I've ever prayed like that. You're just praying to God and and nothing come out. I don't think I've ever done that. But that's what she was doing. And he happened to walk in the door, and he sees her there. And she's nailed down, and she's going, but ain't nothing come out of her mouth. So he suspects something's wrong, doesn't he? He suspects something wrong when he comes in. I read this, and I hadn't read this before, so it's, it's something I didn't know. <laughs> But this is these feasts that they had. The writer of one of the books I'm studying this. This is what he says about it. He says at the feasts, it was not uncommon for people in the feasts to drink a little too much and get drunk. And I think about something for all these things we have uptown up there. They can't do nothing without something to drink up there. I don't think you can go down Main Street without something to drink up there. I don't believe they can have any kind of festival or get-together where they don't drink something. And then I read that and I said, Lord, that must be Sumter County there. But it ain't just Sumter County. I thought to say Shiloh. Well, no, Shiloh is Shiloh in Sumter County. That little community out there. Well, that's where they was at, Shiloh. That's why I said they were in Sumter County. And they like to drink in here. So he sees her. She, he thinks she's drunk because a lot of times what would happen at those feasts, pagan nations would come in because people like to come where there's a party going on. So the pagans, when they had all them people there and all this was going on, they'd come and they might have drank a little wine where the pagans come they said, give me another glass. I'll take another glass. And that was what happened there. Because in their idol worship, that they worship, they did the same thing. So that's what was going on. But it wasn't that she was consumed with alcohol. This is what I believe, and I'll quit. This was a lady that was ever anybody in the Bible prayed from their hearts to God. This is her. 
she's on it, buddy. She don't, she, she's praying so hard she don't even know he's in the building. She's praying so hard and in touch with God, trying to get that lifeline and get God to do a miracle in her life, she don't even know he's come in. She's still praying. She's still praying. We'll stop there. But I hope we learned it. This lady here is remarkable to me. And when I look at her life, I say, that could be anybody. She is a perfect example of you and I, how life gets us sometimes. She's a perfect example how joy can turn into happiness, of how happiness can turn into joy. She is going to be the prime example of God watching her, looking after her, remembering her. Remember, she says all this to him. And she's sitting there praying when the priest comes in. He thinks she's drunk. He thinks she's drunk. But God don't. She's as sober-minded as anybody's ever been on their knees to God. I really wonder, and I'll never know, as a preacher for all these years, and all my churches, they've been great. Uh, they've been good. If we could ever really understand the impact, and I'm seeing it more here with y'all, of what God can do in a church that makes prayer a key part of what they do. Sometimes, that's one thing I hate about bulletins. I like when I mess up in the bulletin. Y'all ever seen me mess up with the plan? Y'all get a bulletin every Sunday. Y'all ever seen me get astray on that bulletin? You do. I like that. I like to mess it up sometimes. Get real with it. Get real with prayer, folks. I'm going to tell you, there's a God that's watching you. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that remembers you. There's a God that knows everything about you. And there ain't nothing going on right now, right now, that he don't know about. And the other thing is, he wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I, I appreciate it. Make prayer up. I mean, this lady here is an example. We look for examples of what prayer can do. What the prayer, what, what's the, the prayer of one wife can do? The prayer of one wife that could change this. You understand, this prayer, get this before we leave. This prayer is going to change her life forever. Remember that. Remember I said four or five times, you just have those life-changing things that changes your life forever? This is her. She'll never be the same after she gets up off her knees here. Her life will never be the same again because God answered her prayer. And God answers it. That's good. Thank you for being with us. God bless you this week. Hope you have a good week the rest of the week.